Soon I felt the sudden wrench of a hard strike, a feeling that was to become familiar over the years, the one which still never fails to generate something of the same excitement I felt in the moment of that first violent pull. Welcome to Fly Fishing Northwest. I'm Pete Van Geidenbeek, your host, and today we're going to be fishing some still water. Now, still water to us out here in the West is lake fishing, it, not to be confused with uh, the still waters between rapids that people in the Adirondacks and northern Maine think of when they talk about still water. There's a very interesting piece of geography that runs from the eastern Sierra up north uh, into British Columbia along the eastern side of the Cascades and it holds a tremendous number of very rich lakes. The desert lakes such as Pyramid and Malheur uh, in Oregon and then on up into Washington where you have Lanise and Nunley and Dry Falls. Um, and above that, uh, above being an altitude, a group of lakes that are called high arid lakes. Nothing much is different except there's a little more vegetation. Uh, the one thing that is common and wonderful is that they're all very, very rich lakes and given half a chance they grow big trout. Today we've brought along some people to help us understand this fishing, probably the most important of which is uh, Steve Raymond, noted author, serious fisherman. Uh, Steve written books, you probably know that you're the angler, uh, his book on steelhead called Steelhead Country and others. Uh, I think maybe one of Steve's favorite books is Kamloops, and of course that just happens to be the kind of trout that we're fishing for in this lake today. Steve, tell me about a Kamloops trout. I keep hearing this, uh, you know, people talk about it as being a, a, a separate species. Uh, I mean, just, just what is it? Well, people used to think it was a separate species or a subspecies. Now it's known that Kamloops trout are uh, genetically the same as rainbow trout. Uh, what's unique about them is where they live. They, native to a group of lakes around the Kamloops area in southern interior British Columbia. Uh, high elevation lakes, uh, very productive with long growing seasons. The trout grow very rapidly, they fight very well, uh, but they're unique to that environment. You can't take the Kamloops trout out of British Columbia and still have it be a Kamloops trout. If you really want to fish for Kamloops, you have to go there. And it's, they grow fast and they're big and strong and that's the great, the great attraction. And they fight so well. Yeah. A lot of people think they fight as well or better as, as a summer steelhead. Mm. You know, you and I have known each other for a lot of years and, and uh, I, you, you excel at many kinds of fishing. You write about a lot of it, you do a lot of it, yet I think that, that this fishing like on this pretty little lake here in the Okanagan country of eastern Washington is a, is a favorite kind of fishing, is it? It is, and I'm glad you asked me along because uh, this is my favorite kind of fishing. I've been fishing lakes all my life. I was born and raised in this country and we have an awful lot of lakes and they're probably the most productive trout fishing we have. We, we do have some, some nice rivers too, but uh, the lakes are where most of the big trout are and uh, I spent all my life uh, uh, fishing for them and uh, I think you'll, you'll find out why I enjoy it. Well, we've got uh, uh, Les Johnson has uh, got our various uh, conveyances and I know uh, we'd all like to get out and catch a few fish. So after a couple of words from our sponsors, uh, we'll be down on the lake and uh, let's see if we can't catch a couple. Fly Fishing Northwest on Prime Sports is brought to you by Internet Waterway, the premier online site for boaters and fishermen, www.iwol.com. Well, welcome back. We are down here at the uh, launch area, and uh, you can see two different uh, ways of, of uh, fishing a lake. Um, 
there was a lot of controversy back and forth. Or not controversy, but good-natured discussion. Steve, <clears throat> as you can see, loves his pram. Steve, you can't get him out of a pram, whether it's Puget Sound or one of the high lakes. Uh, Steve, why? I mean, I, I've tried to talk you into all sorts of things. You won't get out of that pram. What's good about a pram? Some people call this my office. Uh, I like it because I can get up high off the water and often see fish when the water is clear and cast to them. That's the most fun of all, I think. Also, it lets me use these uh, little short rods that I like. That you, have, you have to have a longer rod in the float tube or something that keeps you close down in the water. Those are a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, Les, you're, uh, you're in one of the new uh, pontoon boats or kick boats. They seem to be getting a number of different names these days. Um, what's the advantage there? Why not a pram for you? Well, these, uh, the, the one advantage they, they uh, have is that they are very portable. A lot of people are using smaller cars and smaller vans, and, and uh, these do uh, pack up a little tighter, but this is uh, really, they're very new, so it's something I'm just trying. You still need the long rod you need in the float tube. Well, it looks like, now you were, uh, you're the uh, provider of equipment for this trip. Where's my boat? You got it? You were rigging me a boat. Right, right, right there. What? That? Okay. <laughs> what? Do they have uh, uh, search and rescue in this county? Yeah, 911, and we do You're have to call 911 if, if I'm getting in this. <laughs> now, it's all serious. A lot of people use flow tubes, and they're wonderfully portable. But, you know, after all, I'm getting on in years, a little long in the tooth, and uh, I, don't I have a boat? This is it. <laughs> well,. <laughs> I guess we'll uh, go out and see if we can catch some fish and uh, hope that 911 is close by. First time for everything, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah, the fishing rod, that's it. So you just sit down in this rascal like this, right? Whoa. Huh? Whoa. Ah, there it is. Okay. Okay. You did call 911, right? Okay, see you on the other side. Tell my wife I loved her. Terribly big. Whoa! <laughs> I got was about four pounds. How big is yours? Wow! Yeah, this one's really. These are really big fish. Bye, <laughs> right babe. Very nice fish. Well, we got two bugs at work now. I was sitting here watching you with my fly hanging over the side of the boat, and the fish came up and took it. <laughs> That's great. You got your cellular phone so you can call 911? I already called them, Steve. What did they say? They put you on hold? Hey, they said I explained the truth of the matter and uh, we'll probably see them anytime. <laughs> anytime. Well, geez, I guess. What I told you, that's him. Get down and stop thrashing, you silly fish. OK. 
okay. Now, you gave me, you gave me trouble for the float tube, but I did lay you right on top of that, that one. That's a, that's a start. That's a, Okay, the, well, I'm work, I'm trying to work my way back <laughs> into good graces. Small recovery. Well, you got to start somewhere. Come on, fish, head in the other direction, will you? Can't get them on the reel. country here. Yo. That's a good one. Yeah, it's a nice fish. Good spawning color. Okay. Nice fish. Yeah. What, 17 inches? Nice shape? Yeah. What else, uh, if a fellow's going to a lake and he's uh, you know, prospecting, not much is going on the surface, uh, what, what would you start with? What would you have someone start with? Well, I usually start with a big black fly. Do you? Something uh, black? The water in this lake is not especially clear, and I think the fish can see black under these circumstances better than they can see anything else. Uh -huh. And that's kind of my fallback position. Les, would you buy that? You betcha. Black is visible in this murky water, I think, further than anything. Well, what are these, uh, you know, or these woolly buggers? What is it these fish think uh, they're they're eating? Are leeches or what? I think probably leeches. You know, I I checked uh, around the shoreline earlier and found a rock with a leech stuck to it, so oh. I know they're here. Well, I'm glad you told me now that I'm floating out here in my float tube. Do they like uh, waders? Yeah. Oh, they love waders. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Les, what have you been using over there? You have pretty good luck. Well, I had olive and a black woolly bugger, and then I've used a, a six-pack, which is like a, a little carry special with uh -huh. an olive-dyed pheasant hackle on it. How are you, how are you working that? Uh, you fast, slow, erratic? What's well, the... intermediate line and uh, letting it sink real slow. This is pretty shallow here. And then and then just uh, two or three strips and a pause. Uh -huh. Not real fast. Well, whatever it is, it seems to be working. Ooh, that is a big fish he's got up there. Well, it's, you know, I write steelhead country and all that stuff and Kamloops, and I guess the fish are, uh, you know, responding. They line up. They appreciate they all the publicity up. they've gotten and the nice things he said about them. Yeah, you That's know. That's fair. They, Those are good books. They know that they're standing in the shadow. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the chief has arrived on the lake. That's right. <laughs> Oh, that's a nice big fish. Well, you know, he uses those little seven-foot rods. He, he fishes real light. Yeah, he does. But you know the old Lee Wolf theory about uh, the light rod uh, having more flex and uh, therefore, you know, taking up a lot of the drives or jumps and quick moves of the fish and also your own mistakes. Yeah, but you can't use short rods very well in, in these uh, conveyances. No, because you just, you got to yeah. get some reach, but of They're course made that's... for long rods. Yeah, he wouldn't be able to do that in a... Uh, no. In a float tube. Oh, Lester. There we go. Wow. Lift that up all the way, Steve, if you can. Wow, nice fish. About four pounds. Steve, what do you think? About time we uh, maybe uh, slipped off and had a little coffee? <laughs> Just when the fishing's getting good? Well, the fishing's getting good, but I had a lot of coffee earlier today, and I think it's very important that we go to shore and, and have a little coffee. You're supposed to take care of those things before you come out. It's easy for you to say in your boat. <laughs> we'll go and have some lunch, and we'll be right back with more Fly Fishing Northwest in just a few minutes.
Welcome back to Fly Fishing Northwest. One of the patterns that's been very good for us here is the woolly bugger. It's a good early season fly and one that's very easy to tie. Tie the woolly bugger, you start with a TMCO 5263 hook and we add a small piece of wire to the back which we're going to use later to lock in the hackle. And we take a marabou plume and just go in and clip a little V out of it like that. That gives that fly a lot more action with a piece of that stem cut out. We take about a little longer than the length of the hook, set it in there, lock it in with the thread, and take it all the way forward. Just trim that excess off. Take a little bit of flashaboo. We talked about flashaboo. A little is good, a lot doesn't do much more for you. So we're going to take about three strands of flashaboo. Just lay them in there, and I like them a little bit longer than the marabou. But they kind of just stick out a little bit further when it's all wet. And we use a green, olive green hackle. We're going to tie it in at the tip, not at the front. Lay it in there like that. A couple of turns to lock it in. Come, in. Come forward. Now one trick that makes a nice woolly bugger, and it's not hard to do, is when you, you don't tie it, the chenille in at the back of the fly. If you tie everything in at the back of the fly, it gets lumpy at the back, and you wind up with a fly with a big lump at the back, and it's not even. We're going to tie this in at the front, put it nice and tight, and wrap all the way to the back. Makes it all even through here. Now, we come forward with the chenille, nice and even. And this is, you see this body on this fly, it's going to be very even. Big build up at the back. Good looking fly, even though we're tying them in the field because we need them in the back. Now we come forward with the hackle. One nicely in front of the other, and it'll just lay in there beautifully. So at the front, flip it off. Now we've tied in a little piece of wire, copper wire, and we go the opposite direction. Just sort of wiggle it and run it right through the opposite direction of the stem. It doesn't knock down any of the hackle, and what it does is it pins down that hackle stem making a much stronger fly. So even if that hackle stem breaks, the fly's not going to come apart. Wrap it down good and tight. And a couple of half hitches. And you don't even have to use any head cement on this. There you have a woolly bugger ready to fish. We're uh, taking a little break, and uh, in the process, uh, we had a chance to sit here and talk to uh, Steve Raymond some. I, you know, I felt like I've known Steve for a lot of years, and I think it was through his writing. As I've gotten to know him personally, I've, I've, uh, I realize he has a lot to say. And uh, Steve, tell me a little bit about how you feel about fishing. I know you've got some, some special thoughts, and you're able to express them better than most of us. Uh, tell me, how do you feel about it? Well, fishing is, is what I do. It's what I've always done. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. I suppose everybody has their own reasons for, for going fishing. For me, I think it's because uh, I find trout and salmon, to be honest, and uncompromising, and you can meet them only on their own terms, which isn't true of a lot of other <laughs> things that you run across these days. Uh, I think uh, fishing teaches humility, and uh, humility is a virtue that most of us could do with a little more of. Uh, I think that 
one of the reasons I like to fish is because of the friends that I make fishing. Some of the best friendships I've ever had have been made along trout streams. And it also has the restorative quality that everybody talks about. You know, when I spend a day on the stream, it's good for my blood pressure and improves my outlook on life. <laughs> well, we could all use a little more of that uh, restorative uh, energy these days. You, you also, uh, I, I notice in, in your fishing, you don't, uh, you don't keep fish. No, uh, you subscribe to that uh, hook and release philosophy. Is that, uh, or why is that? Well, it's easy for me because I never really have liked to eat fish. Well, that, that helps. <laughs> but I also think that, uh, you know, fish are too valuable to be caught mm -hmm. only once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you put them back, they'll be there the next time for you and everybody else. That's what you should do. You, know, you mentioned uh, valuable or fish being too valuable to be caught only once, and I, th I think that was a, a, a Lee Wolf right. statement, as I remember. And uh, he was quite an environmentalist and certainly fought the good the good fight for uh, uh, conservation. You've been active in the Federation and uh, Trout Unlimited. Do you do you think that all of us should be? I think that everybody who's a, a fisherman or who likes to fish should be active in some sort of conservation mm -hmm. work. Uh, if, if that's how you get your pleasure, then you have an obligation to, to put something back into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, with as many different uh, fish and trouble as there are these days, uh, we need all the help we can get. Yeah, we certainly do. I, I suppose I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you if there isn't another book or two in the system. There's a couple more in the system, uh, not terribly far along yet, but give me some time. You know, I, for me, uh, I, I think fly fishing is a sport that has many different levels and writing about it is uh, merely an extension of one of those levels for me. It, it's as natural as tying flies or any other aspect of the sport. It's part of the pleasure that I get out of it. And another part of the pleasure is uh, hearing from people who've read my, my books. That's always a treat. That's nice. Well, that certainly gives us all something uh, additional to look forward to. And right now, I'm looking forward to going back out on the lake and uh, seeing if we can't catch another trout or two. So am I. Let's do it. Dan, have we made a convert out of you? You like this still water fishing? Well, I certainly like it, and uh, I can see why people become totally obsessed with it, Steve. It's the, uh, the mystery of what's going on uh, under the surface and trying to read the sign is, uh, it's interesting. I, uh, and you like a little more of this, I'll be hooked, I think. Good. You like fishing out of a boat better than a float tube? Yeah, I do, but that's not to demean the float tube. I was really impressed, frankly, with all, all kidding aside, that float tube is a, is a darn nice way to fish. <laughs> oh, oh, nice jumps. Oh, train fish, this is the one that's gonna tow me home. He's all right. That's better than 16 inches. That's yeah, a nice it fish. is a little better. That's a nice fish. Well 18 done. inches. I actually got two good strikes, you know, by casting out and coming back. There we go. <laughs> well, we've had a nice day today uh, fishing the Stillwater Lakes of eastern Washington. This high arid country has uh, been good to us. S Steve uh, Raymond and Les Johnson have taught us a bit about Stillwater fishing. We hope you've enjoyed it. So for Fly Fishing Northwest, until next time, this is your host, Pete Van Guidenbeek. Wish you tight lines. Fly Fishing Northwest is brought to you by Sage, the fly fishing company. 
Wherever you go, Sage manufactures a high-performance fly rod and reel to meet all your fishing needs. And a special thanks to Moccasin Lake Ranch. If you'd like to fish that lovely little lake, give Ross Beatty a call. Honest to God, if this safety strap lets go, I'm history. <laughs> <laughs> Could be serious. <laughs>